Well, what a privilege to uh, be with you this morning. I've been in most of your nations, and we've sent our ship. We've just purchased our fifth ship, but it's been to almost every nation here, unless you don't have a port like Afghanistan and Nepal, then we send teams from the port uh, to those countries. It's a privilege to be invited to my adopted city. I'm a, from a small town in New Jersey, just across the bridge from New York City, where Jesus found me. I wasn't from a Christian home. It's the son of a Dutch immigrant. And uh, my hometown is a little place called Wyckoff. But my hometown now is London. And I'm celebrating 60 years since I came here and being in this area uh, is very special because I spent so many hours giving out leaflets at Victoria uh, Station. So it really is an honor. You know, when you're my age, invitations drop. People don't invite people over 80 to speak in their churches for their big events. There are exceptions. Obviously, this, uh, this is one of them. You know, I don't blame people. But, you know, they, some of them now think George Rivers dead, so they're not going to invite him. But uh, hallelujah for every open door. I've been ministering in nine different countries. And I think it's clear from all that we've done together in worship and all that's been said that God wants to bless you. I often read Psalm 67 about how God wants to bless you so that you may bless the nations. I love the name of your church. And of course, I've got a shirt that has almost all the nations of the world. I usually wear a global jacket, but it's getting a bit hot. So the Lord in his mercy gave me this uh, shirt. I lived in India, I lived in the tropics. and. Uh, this kind of shirt, of course, is much better. I didn't know so many people would be here. I don't always do my homework. I'm not only in the fast lane, half the time I seem to be off the road. And so I just bought the smallest book display I, I ever, I think, put up. I brought it all with me in two small uh, suitcases coming by public transport. I live now in uh, the Bromley area, but I used to live in Tasso Road, Fulham, then 30, Ro 30 Middleton Road, Dolspin, and um, you know, I really believe that London is one of the great mission fields in the world, Hallelujah. especially for those of us who are limited. I speak Spanish as well, but I'm mainly limited uh, to English. And of course, um, so often you can get in conversation with people from all over the world who speak English, not, not all of them. So what a privilege, what a joy. I have about 100,000 people who follow me in prayer um, all over the world. I've been in 100 countries, so I know that God is going to move. He already is in this meeting. Amen. And I'm going to speak to you about something. Yes. Uh, my experience is that with so many believers, I only have 67 years observing believers, that for so many it's all in the head. They love it. It's in the head. Lots of worship, lots of verses, lots of talks, seminars, and then more seminars. I'm not against those things, but the word is clear in James. Be not hearers of the word, but be doers. Yes. And there are many believers, it's easier for them to worship for an hour than to speak five minutes to a Muslim who lives down the road. And one million of them live in this city and if we don't respond to loving them listening to them trying to reach them and share jesus and some are coming to jesus then it's a proof that a lot of it is still in the head and this is my heart cry i got in a lot of trouble when i started to preach at 17 in my hometown and i preach radical commitment don't just talk about it. Don't just sing about it. Put your life on the line, your money on the line, the, your time on the line. Radical. It's not one day a week. It's not a few hours a week. It's 24 hours a day in tune with the Holy Spirit, obedient to the Holy Spirit, 
to reach the whole world with the gospel. It's so clear just before Jesus ascended into heaven. He said when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we're often talking about the Holy Spirit. You shall be my witnesses. Amen. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Satan who is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Has resisted every effort. And if you study the history of the Christian church. The devastation across North Africa by the great Muslim crusades, uh, you'll, your, 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 your head will just <laughs> swing because the enemy won many, many a victory. There are 30 nations that have almost no witness at all. They may have a few churches with expatriates. They may have a few traditional Christians who have the name Christian. But those who know Jesus personally have a relationship. I have a t-shirt I wore on my weekly blog. I do a weekly blog on YouTube. It said religious people. I just got a hold of it. Religious people killed Jesus. And then I, on the back of the t-shirt. Um, I don't have that t-shirt on this morning. Um, it says it's about, not about religion. It's about relationships. And I'm sure most of you, and that's why you're here worshiping, have a relationship with Jesus. But we know the majority of people right here, our neighbors, don't have that relationship with Jesus. Even though they may go to church, it's hard. And I'm not easily discerning, you know, who knows Jesus and who doesn't know Jesus. If they're committed churchgoers, I have to leave it with God. But in my experience in thousands and thousands of churches, for many, it's just a name and a culture. And if you came in from other countries, you came into a nation in which cult, the culture has many Christian values. Some of them are decreasing. Others are actually increasing. <clears throat> if you really have discernment to know what is actually going on, rather than just generalizations. And I want to shout from the housetop. God is still working here in the UK. Amen. People, for example, <coughs> think that uh, Keswick Convention, 125 years old, <coughs> excuse me, that must have finished a long time ago. I was at Keswick last Sunday night, not, not yes, Sunday, Sunday night, not speaking. There were 3,000 jammed into that meeting, singing the praises of God, hearing the preaching of the Word. And that goes on for three weeks. Every week, another two or 3,000. That's just one little part. That's just one little part. God works through diversity. And yesterday, just down the road here at the Emmanuel Center, we celebrated the life of... Uh, Gerald Combs, thanks. I, I almost said Barney Combs. They both founded uh, unique networks here in Britain. And there are many new networks. And there are many amazing churches like yours. So God is on the move. Christendom is shrinking. You can't find anything in the New Testament about Christian nations. I know, of course, it got so complicated when Constantine made Christianity official around the year 300. Before that, everybody more or less had to be a disciple because you might be a martyr. And Christianity then became official. But uh, it became incredibly complex. I spent 60 years studying this. Yet God was still working. God was still working. Now we're in a different period of history, especially in Europe. Very different in some other parts of the world. But God is still working. We need to stay positive. I preach to myself when I say that because I have a mean negative streak. Just very hard for me not to see problems. God in his mercy actually used that sometimes, but it doesn't justify it. My latest book, I finally got honest, Confessions of a Toxic Perfectionist, which especially impacted my marriage. And my wife and I, she read in the school newspaper, I was a man of God. That did it. She wanted to marry a man of God. We didn't really know each other. And I had been on a two-year fast. My life was so complicated as a baby Christian with all these different girls. 
and I was addicted to romance and started to get into the world of soft pornography. So I went on a two-year fast. That's when I went to Mexico. That's when this work started. That's when I learned Spanish. That's when I went through God's discipleship program, similar to what you're doing here in this church in a different way, especially through books. Books have been always key in seeing people disciple. But I, that caused me to leave university and I arrived at a Bible college in Chicago. And boom! There were hundreds of girls, oh, Christian girls, you know, born again. I thought, well, I'm finally safe. I thought if I try to kiss one of them, I'll get King James to the head. So I didn't, though I was infatuated with seven of them, I didn't do anything. And then in God's mercy, when I went to rent an evangelistic film, the woman in charge of the film, it just blew my circuits. My romantic circuits blew. I broke my fast, moved in on the target, said something completely stupid. She was not interested, but I managed to get her on that first date. I, this was such a fantastic romantic feeling. I thought this is a trick of the devil. Have you ever had that problem? What's from the devil and what's from God? And uh, so I tried to scare her away. I said, probably nothing going to happen between you and me, but you need to know, I'm going to be a missionary. And if you marry me, probably you will be eaten alive in Papua New Guinea. I hope there's no one here from Papua New Guinea. There was someone sitting next to me on the ship the other day, and she explained that they're no longer eating people in Papua New Guinea. That's good. The nation with more languages than almost any nation in the world. Hundreds of languages in one country. What a task the Bible translators have had. Anyway, my, this lady, her name was Trina, wasn't that interested. But then in the school newspaper, she read, I'd just come back from Mexico, we'd see answers to prayer and breakthroughs in prayer, and sharing about it to the other students, about a thousand students there. And... Uh, the school newspaper said George Brewer, man of, man of God. And so she prayed about it. And before we knew what happened, we were married. I was very extreme. Money is only for God's work. We're not spending any money. Weddings, receptions, honeymoon, forget it. That's all on the altar. We're going to Mexico and we're going to sell possessions, including your possessions, and put the money into global missions. And I gave her the key verses from the book of Ephesians. Um, she was, um, she wouldn't like me to say this, but she was naive. She just accepted whatever I said. I'm a man of God. And um, so I gave her that key verse, submit unto your husband as unto the Lord. And so she did. She was actually scared of me in the first weeks of the marriage. I told her the other day, we have together now 62 years, and I just told her the other day an original thought. I said, honey, in the first days of the marriage, you were scared of me. Now, in our final years, I want to just be honest, I'm scared of you. <laughs> my wife, by the way, has never, never really grabbed on to my humor. And uh, we, we do need prayer. We, we don't want to blow it in these senior years. You know, three kids, five grandkids, six great grandkids. And you know, if you think they're all jumping up in the air, so yeah, yeah, keep clapping. Uh, if you think they're all jumping in the air for Jesus, uh, well, wait till you have that, that crowd and see if they all, all follow him. So many younger people under the tremendous pressure of society, the anti-Christian mode, the, the you know, gossip, have walked away from their faith, especially in university. It's one of the reasons we distribute all kinds of books that can help answer tough questions. In my first year at university, before I went to Bible college, I almost lost my faith. We had professionals in that school that knew how to tear your faith apart. But it's books. Books on archaeology, books even written by scientists that helped me intellectually to keep running and have been running ever since. Anyway, our marriage went really well. We just lived on the floor in the back of a bookstore. We just opened. And I was just praising God all the time. And the marriage went really well <laughs> for several weeks. <laughs> and she started to read other verses. <laughs> we got to be careful with whole chapters. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives as Christ 
love the church. 62 years of failure. I'm sure if you knew what a failure I was, I wouldn't be invited. But here I am, and I don't expect to get invited back. God uses all kinds of people, and how he ever used me to start what became one of the largest mission agencies in the world. In Britain alone, 25,000 have gone through training, mobilization, and served with OM, 25,000. We just celebrated our 60th anniversary. Uh, in India, another 20, 30, 40,000. In Pakistan and Bangladesh, thousands. Globally, 200,000 have served with Operation Mobilization and our ships reaching literally one billion people with the gospel in some way. It may have only been a gospel track. How did all this get started? Let's look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. I think that's going to like pop up on the screen or something. Woo, there it is. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved. This is the key phrase. He was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep, having no shepherd. Then he said, what a surprise statement after what the previous statement was. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, I had a very happy childhood. My parents, his father being a, an immigrant, very hardworking, one of the best for his family. And so I had good parents, I had a happy childhood. And of course, then as a teenager, I got into all kinds of things. And constantly getting infatuated with different girls. In our culture in New Jersey, dating starts when you're around 11. You learn how to dance together. And in those days, people didn't eat quickly. A few did, but didn't quickly jug in bed and had sex, which has become the order of the day in uh, especially European culture, which is extremely sad, but my, not my topic for this morning. So I was doing fine. I was about to be elected president of the student government of a thousand students. I was about to be voted Mr. Ramsey High School, another ego trip. And it all changed through one woman. And I'm sure there are women like that here this morning. And maybe some men. A woman of prayer. A woman of the word. And she took literally this command we have just read. And she constantly was praying for workers and she lived very close to this high school where I ended up going in God's mysterious providence. And her son, a godly man, still alive, medical doctor, was a senior when I came in as a freshman. It's a four-year secondary school. And um, his life, which I watched, I had a very foul mouth. And I never heard him swear. I, I, I didn't know that anybody existed that didn't swear. You know, when I got upset with one of my neighbors because I used to get in fights, you know, I went down to his house and wrote S-H-I-T in big black paint on the side of his house. My father, by the way, didn't appreciate my artwork and I had to go and paint over that. So this guy who was in charge in the locker room, which is a very foul place in the American high school, he, he carried his Bible, also I never heard of anybody carrying a Bible. So it was a new world for me. But I was so caught up, especially in baseball and basketball and sports, some of it good, some of it not good. And this woman of God put my name, and this may be the only thing you remember from this message, because we're all on information overload. But this woman put my name on her prayer list, not only prayed that God would save me, but she prayed God would send him. Send him. Now, you probably didn't want me in her town anymore. Lord, send him. And then she sent a gospel of John. You know, here in Britain for the last 10 years, we give out tens of thousands of gospels of John to people who want them. If 
very hard to get a Christian in Britain to give out anything, especially in the streets. They might do it privately. And I must say it's people from other nations, as I speak in different ethnic churches, uh, that really are out in the streets of these Gospels of John. We just had another 50,000. Of course, there are other groups that have Gospels. Anyway, it's the most important book in my life, for sure. Because around that same time, I started to dabble in the world of soft pornography. And so I started reading this Gospel. To make a long story short, it broke into my heart and made me ready for a one-night meeting with Billy Graham in Madison Square Garden, New York City. By the way, there's a film of my life story and I brought, it's one of the items I have uh, a few extra copies. By the way, these books are just for any donation, even one pound. And if you are a reader, and I know many people are not reading, but if you are a reader, you can get my email from the letter on that table and I will send you my special book pack, no strings attached, no being added to a database, I'll just send you those books because I know how books have been such a tremendous blessing. My first book alone brought me 25,000 letters over a period of 30 or 40 years. So I went to that Billy Graham meeting. I sat as far away as I could. Naturally, I brought one of these gals I was totally infatuated with. And uh, I even had binoculars to watch Billy Graham because some people said he's a hypnotist. And so I'm watching Billy Graham and he preached a clear gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then he did something very strange. He called people to repent, to get out of their seat, to come forward and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. And initially, you know, I just froze of God and who can understand God's working. Look at those verses of Romans of chapter 11, those last few verses. The mystery of God's working. Unsearchable, unsearchable His ways. We should stop asking some of these questions about why God allowed this, why God allowed that. Who are we to completely understand the mind of the Lord? Anyway, study those verses. And Jesus saved me that night, March 3rd, 1955, a long time ago. He saved me, sent me, and filled me with the Holy Ghost that same night. I've never missed a day walking in the power of God's grace. That is a miracle. Because in many ways, before you clap, because in many ways, uh, I'm a bad guy. I'm still the kind of guy that can get bad thoughts. And I tell you, it would be a scary thing if an attractive woman completely naked uh, walked into a cabin in the woods where I was stuck and depressed and couldn't find my Bible. I will not want to say, but trusting by God's grace, that will never happen. Hallelujah, never did happen. But someone left a porno, soft porno magazine in the woods, actually not far from where you used to live. <laughs> and I was in the woods, and there this magazine, somebody used it for target practice. It just caught, now I'm a leader. God's using me. Thousands have professed Christ in my meetings. And now, here I am in the woods. And so, boy, especially uh, in certain churches, they want to hear mainly about victories. So, of course, I just looked at the, magazine and zap I destroyed it by the power of God that's what we like to hear right how many are into truth any of you into the truth thing yeah the magazine made a fool out of me when you're a high achieving goal aimed person carrying huge responsibilities you feel like total scum and I thought how can God use me maybe I've even lost my way and I just go back to the devil's ways that uh, Jesus set me free from that day in March. But I knew this book. I knew verses like 1 John chapter 2. Sin not. That's my goal every day. I'm a fanatic on holiness. I upset more people preaching about holiness than you would ever even want to think about. I'm still strong on holiness. But we need the second part of the verse as well. If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I share my heart in this last two books 
that I wrote as an older person to pass on my legacy as I stepped out of old leadership 19 years ago after 46 years in the hot seat. And I tell you, the last 19 years for me have been better than the previous 19. Because leadership, when you're in a fast expanding, growing movement with people from 60, 70 nationalities, a wide range of denominations as we were committed to be interdenominational, there's a lot of pain involved, especially when there are broken relationships. So don't be too worried about when you get older and you lose your particular long-term job. God has something for you that could even be better. There's no retirement program for kingdom people. There's change, and some don't handle change. There's sometimes slowing down. My blog this coming week is seven things you can do without getting out of bed, including a, quite a dynamic exercise program. In some ways, I'm looking forward to it, but maybe not yet. Of course, it depends on someone around to help you a little bit. No retirement program. Any of you know, you, you all look so young, but I have eye problems. Um, but if you know older people, just give them a personal George Verwer jab. You know, George Verwer says there's no retirement, so why don't you get with it? Here, here's 50 Gospels of John. Go give them out in front of Victoria Station. Anyway, you'll let me know what your response is. By the way, I answer every email personally. So he saved me and sent me, and I saw amazing answers to prayer. And I want to encourage you, no matter how many discouragements you've had in prayer, and I've had many of those, God answers prayer, and we need you to persevere. I'm going to make this quick. It's a summary of just some of the miracles and answers to prayer I've seen in the midst of the battle. First, my own family. They all came to Jesus. We were a small family. My sister, all of our children, five children, came to Jesus. One full-time with OM in the Muslim world. Another one is a pastor. The second target was my high school. I had the opportunity to share with a thousand students my testimony. It's now illegal in America, but not then. And people started to come to Jesus. When I came back from university, and I'd been travailing and praying for the high school, we started prayer meetings in the high school. And uh, when I came back for Christmas break, I guess I was about 18 by then, hundreds came to get a, a, an update on what's going on with loudmouth Burwer. And in that meeting, about 125 stood to believe on Jesus. I'm sure they weren't all born again. And one of them was my own father, son of a Dutch atheist. So as a teenager, I saw a major answers to prayer. Individual friends having the privilege of leading him to Jesus. And then God at university gave me the privilege even though I was so young to go into prisons, go into jails. That's when I had another powerful experience with the Holy Spirit that I thought maybe this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit after reading a book about that. Because when I went into the jail the next day, there was much more authority, much more power, seemingly in my witness. And a number in the jail came to Jesus. That opened the door for me to go to the Nashville State Penitentiary and speak even to a large crowd of women, most of whom had committed murder. But there at university, God more and more was putting the nations on my heart and starting to pray for all the nations and getting all the material I could get uh, about the nations. And in an amazing way, he just put it on my heart. Go to Mexico. I've, I've been learning Spanish. Go to Mexico. And so I challenged my college roommate. Hey, I think we ought to go to Mexico next summer. He didn't know what to say. He, just, he said, yeah, well, yes. Then I went to the man who's to become my lifelong friend, a very laid back, more intellectual person. And I said, Dale, I, I feel God's leading us to Mexico to distribute literature. Many Mexicans have never had the gospel, never had anything. Whereas at least in the States, most of us have access to the Bible. And Dale wanted a lot of time to pray and think about it. I said, let's pray right now, Dale. And so he prayed, I prayed and say, well, okay, Dale, are you going? <laughs> He said, okay. So the three of us went to Mexico without knowing we were birthing this movement that only in Europe became known as Operation Mobilization. Now when God puts things on our hearts and we go for it, it doesn't always work out. And that's why one of the little history books about OM 
and it's called failure the back door to success my vision in the early days partly through the amazing people I met at Moody was the Muslim world communist world closed countries that's it Western Europe not included places like Kenya forget it most of Africa south of the Sahara south of the Sahel forget it they got lots of churches they've had lots of missionaries India forget it so some of it was false thinking but I was young and so my vision was Afghanistan Iraq Iran heard of those places huh? yes. Syria and the Soviet Union it's not time to tell about my early days of marriage in Mexico I already touched on that opened three or four five more bookstores saw people come to Christ learn better Spanish and launched out to Spain and in Spain again we saw it came out in a leaflet miracles in Spain because we saw God do things that had never been done in Spain but I was completely captured that was a semi-closed country that's the only reason we were there the vision we had at that time our movement was called send the light but I was fervently studying Russian and the plan for Bible distribution the next summer in the Soviet Union a lot of prayer a lot of effort I thought this is from God I got across the Russian border with the, even a small printing press all this stuff hidden and praising the Lord and then I made a really stupid mistake I threw a gospel. We were, going to, we were going to do this all through the po internal postal system, which we had done in Spain successfully. And so I broke my own rule. This one gospel had some grease or butter on it, and my co-worker, with just two of us, said, let's get rid of it. Flush it down the toilet. I thought, how can we flush the Word of God down the toilet? I said, we'll give it out tomorrow when no one is looking. Ha! Pure stupidity. The next day, I let it go out the window of the car in a totally rural area where I didn't think anybody was looking. Within 10 miles, the KGB and the police had a major roadblock. They arrested me. It was in the newspapers throughout the Soviet Union. American spy arrested in Rovno. It was actually in Ukraine. Changed the course of my life. Maybe you've had some failure. Maybe you've made some wrong turns. Maybe you even, even had a marriage that failed. OM's the first mission group in history to recruit divorced people. I could write three books on how God has used divorced people. We don't forgive, but God does. And the sin of certain kinds of churches, we won't give names, that have wrongly treated women are in many ways even worse than the, than the horror we sometimes see today in the whole abortion crisis and there's not time to go into that but God worked through that situation they finally let me go they decided it was a religious fanatic especially when they discovered the printing press and all this Christian literature we even got one of our guards singing a hymn they gave us a machine gun escort back to Austria and I was just broken broken before the Lord I would often spend days of prayer so I went into the mountains for prayer with my friend Roger and just thinking about Western Europe. My wife's father was killed in, in the war. People in those days were very conscious of the war. We're talking 1961. And I, I was actually on the top of a tree, worshiping the Lord. I was young, I used to climb things, got into rock climbing. And right there, God gave me the vision. He gave me the name Operation Mobilization. He gave me the vision to mobilize thousands of Europeans to reach all of Europe first and then let it spill over because Europeans could drive to Turkey. They could drive to Afghanistan. Within two years, we had whole caravans of trucks going to India. Dave was among them. That continued for 20 years as God, through that new experience, gave me the vision for India. And when I went there to visit our teams who had a terrible time driving there on that first trip, and then I did my initial tour of India, again, my life was radically changed. And I knew God was calling me to India. I knew that India was to be the number one country in my life, and that has continued. Even in these days, I'm in touch with India every single day. It will soon be the nation with the largest population in the world, bypassing China in the next one or two years. And there are hundreds of millions, despite tremendous work by many groups, 
OM is only one in our Good Shepherd churches as we converted into a church movement. And so hundreds of millions have been reached. Hundreds of thousands have come to Jesus. But we're talking 1.4 billion people. So there are hundreds of millions of Indians that have never heard the gospel. We're not talking about personal evangelism. Of course, wonderful. We're talking about never having a track, never having had a gospel. And this is a nation where hundreds of millions have had literature. So on one hand, there's so much to rejoice over. There's a great harvest. On the other hand, it's like this other part of India doesn't exist because there are so many people. And right here, so many from India, and of course, Bangladesh and Pakistan, which were all one country up to 1947. We have about 2,000 workers in India right now, and these are very difficult days. If you could pray for our work, even email me that you'd be willing to do that. We can't release much news because of security. And we're a very large movement there. And uh, it's very complicated, fortunately. It's moved out of OM International to be an indigenous church movement under very dynamic leaders. One woman prayed. One woman took the word of God seriously. I want to ask you, do you take the Word of God seriously? When you read, redeem the time before, because the days of evil, do you make a commitment to make better use of your time? One of the most spirit-filled persons whose books I read said the great sin of this present day is wasting time. And anybody with a little bit of spiritual discernment can see how easily in our culture we waste time. The good becomes the enemy of the best. There's so many good things to do, especially sports. Who's going to say anything negative about sports? Actually, we have a phenomenal, fast-growing sports ministry, so don't get me wrong. But I'll tell you, when you're a radical disciple of Jesus, and you're trying to reach the lost, and you're trying to encourage the saints, and you're praying for revival, and you're involved, you will have limited time, limited time, or these other things. People don't like that message. And when we think of the accumulation, the accumulation of wealth among believers, while millions now with a massive uh, food crisis, massive cost of living crisis, and the impact on Britain, is, and we're getting that in the news every day, aren't we? And it's small compared to these other countries. I'm not saying it's not important. I believe in the food banks. I believe in reaching out to the poor people who might be on my street. There's no comparison to what people are suffering, and some of them in your nations, almost beyond belief. And the women are open at the bottom of the pile, being stepped on and walked on. And sex traffic is one of the biggest industries on planet Earth. And you can be sure it's going on right under our eyes in London. These are not times for playing games. These are not times for just seeking the blessing only. This is a all-out war against the force of darkness who do not want these people across the world to come to Jesus. The present leader of OM, the Chinese brother Lawrence Tom, has shifted OM completely back to church planting among the more unreached people. And I tell you, we're facing huge challenges, especially with COVID hitting us. Brothers and sisters, it's not an accident that we're here this morning. I want to close with just three sentences. It's hard to remember much, isn't it? But I hope you can remember these three sentences, maybe a few of the other things that I said. Number one, God loves you. God loves you. In OM, with thousands of people joining us very quickly, we discovered many didn't really believe God loved them. Because of stupidity, because of failure, because of many reasons, sometimes physical things. And we've had the privilege of praying and counseling people, help them to realize God loves them. My favorite story, I hope you'll remember it. You may have heard it already. This family was in a thunderstorm. And even the family, even the adults were nervous. The lightning was a bit too much. And then they realized their little, their little seven-year-old daughter is alone up in her bedroom. And so they ran upstairs, and they opened the door. They expected she'd be hiding under the bed. 
there was another loud thunder. But there she was, looking out the window. They said, are you okay? We're worried. Are you okay? She looked at them, and she smiled. I think God is taking my photograph. <laughs> God is taking your picture. He loves you. And I tell you, a lot of people, even sometimes in our churches, they don't have a healthy acceptance of themselves. Especially if they prayed over something and, and tried to have deliverance and tried to sort it out. And in the end, it didn't seem to work. Discouragement comes in. Depression comes in. Beware, together with exercising faith, beware of the enemy tactics. And beware of unrealistic expectation. I've for 60 years been listening to people pray prayers. I know they don't believe that is actually going to happen. History shows that never will happen. Of course, God is merciful. Anybody praying is better than no prayer at all. Kierkegaard, a brilliant philosopher, who the only Christianity he knew was the Christendom, the Christendom of Denmark a couple of hundred years ago. And he had a tremendous mind. And he came up with this statement that has really helped a lot of people. He said in Christianity, and he was speaking about what he knew, Christianity, we've created the highest ethic in the world, and we've killed ourselves on that ethic. This is why millions in Europe have walked away from Jesus, especially after the First World War, because they couldn't live up to this ethic. Both sides believed that God was on their side. Some of you have seen that film, Oh, What a Lovely War, would just blow your circuits what happened here during those days? This is not what we read in the Bible. A realistic book. God loves us even when we fail. Even when things don't work out. If you think you've had a lot of disappointments, you send me your list. If my wife and I can't double your list, I'll send you a hundred quid. So I look forward to your list this week. You can't be a long distance, and I've been at this every day for 67 years, with very high goals, with very high aims, giving generally a 14 hour a day, seven days a week. Of course, including lots of worship, lots of praise, also time for fun. And yes, food. Balance became one of the most important things in my life. Probably guys like me shouldn't get married. We should maybe have a parrot. Or maybe a, maybe a cat. But I got married. And God used marriage to break me. To show me the hidden subtleness of male ego self-life. And it's alive and well. It's alive and well in many Christian homes. And domestic violence is out of control in the British Isles. If you don't think it affects churches, you don't know what's going on. You're living in your little fantasy world. We're in total war. And that's why we need total radical commitment to Jesus every day so clear Jesus said again and again if any man follow me let him deny self take up the cross and follow me what about verses like I buffet my body huh I've been startled all my life to see so many Christian leaders fall into immorality I'm sure some of you follow the horror of the God TV. I knew those people. I thought they were spirit-filled people. And suddenly, this man, the founder, leads his wife to run off with a beautiful, attractive woman he found in some other part of the world. A global scandal that drags the church of Jesus Christ into the mud. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And most of my friends who've been in spiritual battle all these years have not had these kind of problems. Of course, there is forgiveness. But when we're in God's work, we need to be committed to purity, to holiness. And this means sometimes we need to, we need to pull back and, and share with somebody what, what is really going on. So God, I know, loves me. Made a lot of mistakes. I talk about them in my new book. I didn't want to be a leader. And yet, somehow, he's kept using me. And every day, I see things happen. The second sentence I leave with you is, God wants to use you. 
God wants to use you. Don't let some little thing I've said, which maybe you haven't understand, keep you from this big message from the Lord. He wants to use you. And I feel led of the Spirit to say, I know some of you are being used more than you give yourself credit for. The Word of God says, even a cup of cold water given in my name will get a reward. So be encouraged as to what the Lord has already done. Don't put yourself down because you think you're less spiritual than someone else. Don't make the silly mistake of putting yourself down because your friend got this particular gift of the Spirit and you never got it. God works in a whole variety of ways. We have to embrace the mystery of that. Otherwise, we basically deny history. We basically deny 95% of everything that God's doing around the world. 100,000 copies of my book, Messiology, have gone out. I'm sure you never heard of the word since I invented it. It's based on a George Burwell proverb which no one is reading. Where two or three of the Lord's people are gathered together, sooner or later there's a mess. There's my negative streak. <laughs> Messiology is a word God put on my heart. And now it's used all over the world theologically. How God works in the midst of the mess. That doesn't justify any sin, but it shows the mercy of God. It shows the way that God has worked. Otherwise, history doesn't make any sense. The Civil War in America, with godly people on both sides of the Civil War killing each other. This whole story of apartheid, the whole story of the caste system in different parts of the world, especially India. History doesn't make sense unless you realize God specializes in working in the midst of it all. He doesn't eliminate it. People think Putin's going to be just eliminated. They've been praying that prayer for a long time. Of course, that would be nice if he came to Jesus first. But history shows that's not the way God works. So many people I've listened to praying for Great Britain for 60 years, those prayers have not been answered, most of them. Because it's not God's agenda. God's agenda is you. This church. His church. His people. We can't comprehend that when there's so much evil all around us and we want to change it. We want to do something about it. And of course we can do something. And it's, it's hard, isn't it, to find that balance. God wants to use you. And God hasn't brought you. You've come from many nations. It's not, you're not here by accident. You are a missionary to London. You don't have to use that term. It's costing a fortune to send missionaries to these 30 nations and other nations. And most missionaries these days don't last more than 10 years. There's just too many complexities, especially children's education. And it grieves me that people from all these nations are here in London and no one is talking to them. I'm not asking much. I'm asking a small step. Just start talking to them. You can't punch them immediately in the nose with the gospel. You can't just bring them to your church. Do you think that people from other cultures would understand what's going on here in the last two hours? People have to be trained. They have to be oriented. They need a relationship with you. They need to be in your home before you take them into church. Of course there are exceptions. People who especially come from a Christian background. But I'm talking about people locked in to the other religions of the world whose thinking and behavior is completely different. And generally, most British people avoid them. May God have mercy. May God have mercy. He wants to use you. And He wants to use you in London. Even small steps. Small steps are better than no steps. And as an evangelist and as a witness, I have a coward streak. So if you've got a coward streak, you write me about it, and I'll tell you about mine. But I know Acts 4.31, when they prayed, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they went forth and spoke the word of God with boldness. And then my third sentence is God wants to send you. Isaiah chapter 6, I'm sure you know the chapter. We see the prophet worshiping the Lord, just as we've been doing here this morning. And when he was worshiping the Lord, he saw the holiness of God. Perhaps you've had a glimpse of that this morning. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And when he saw this, he humbled himself. This is one of the reasons many people are not growing in their faith. They're unwilling to humble themselves. And he prayed this heavy prayer. Lord, woe is me. Woe is me. I prayed it many times. A great prayer for characters like me. A man, a 
a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. He was even willing to take on the sins of those around him. And then he has this experience of forgiveness. And the next verse seems like something out of the book of Romans. But in fact, it's, it's Isaiah 6. And he experiences forgiveness. And then he's ready. Just as when God broke me from my failure in the Soviet Union and he humbled me, then somehow I could hear his voice in that mountain. Operation Mobilization, Western Europe. I didn't have time to tell the rest of the story. I went back and shared it with our leaders. They were all Spaniards. They released me for London. Britain was ripe. Charismatic movement was just being born here. And it was ripe for this message. And soon hundreds from Britain were involved in globally in Operation Mobilization. God wants to send you. Sometimes people criticize short term, but in our culture, anything, there's always a negative side. You, you name anything, you can find a negative side. So of course there are problems with short term. You don't think there's problems with long term missions, you haven't studied it. You know, we're in a spiritual warfare. But in God's providence, with the way the culture was changing, God raised up short term. For me, long term is always better. And of course, tent making, as most of you are, in London is, you know, is part of that. But I believe as much as possible, every one of you needs to have at least a short term experience. So I want to be specific, and I love you to spend a year on our ship. The ship is a totally unique ministry and now we have another ship. We are 100 people short staff. Our leaders, and I'm not involved in the leadership, they want to launch this new ship, former cruise ship, it's in Malaysia, but we don't have the people. We don't even have enough people on our bigger ship, Lagos Hope. It's not just for people that think maybe they're gonna be a missionary. The ship experience is for anyone that would like a better education. Because I don't think our educational system can give us what we can give a person on a ship living in an international community of 70 nations, going from nation to nation, reaching hundreds of thousands, having even tens of thousands visit the ship, go through the coffee bar, go through the evangelistic presentation. And so many have been on the ship. It's been going 51 years since the first ship. My wife and family, we lived on it for a couple of years. Uh, so many have said, this is the greatest experience of your life. Maybe if you wanted to do this, it won't work out. A lot of things in life don't work out. Push the door. Push the door. Take initiative. When I look back in my life, one of the biggest mistakes, and I'm known for a person that takes initiative. Guess what was one of the biggest mistakes? Failure to take the initiative in certain situations. Waiting for people. Some people get discouraged because they feel they don't have any friends. Hey, if you want friends, you better take the initiative. You're on the wrong planet otherwise. And you'll find people respond. One of the greatest joys in my life and my wife's life are all these friends. I'm talking people that I've spent time with or I've helped them come to Christ. And it's just overwhelming. Peter made my successor at his Thanksgiving service last Sunday, 1,800 people showed up. Why would 1,800 people come to a Thanksgiving service? Because he was a man of God, a very humble British Cumbria guy that knew the reality of Jesus, that was in a very tight denomination that he still loved when he went to heaven, but he moved into wider circles and understanding greater the work of the Holy Spirit and did a phenomenal job leading OM for 10 years before Lawrence Tongue. He wants to send you. So after Isaiah had this experience, he said, Lord, here am I, send me. That's a great prayer, isn't it? I'm sure you've all had a message already on Isaiah 6. Maybe you've been to a missions conference. How many of you have already, because we often give an invitation, as I'm gonna do in a minute, in connection with this challenge some make it only for global missions for me no it's a prayer of availability you're already on a mission field it may mean something else but how many of you have already prayed that prayer in your heart or with your hand or whatever here am i send me raise your hand the pastor of course otherwise this church wouldn't exist 
Keep your hand up a little higher. That's encouraging. Yeah. I'm preaching to the choir here. I ought to go home. But there may be a few. Maybe you're new. Maybe this message somehow is touching your heart. And you want to somehow, because God moved in your heart in the worship and in the word, and you want to, you want to make a commitment and say, Lord, I'm available. Maybe you already were available, but you want to be more totally available, which involves this radical commitment we're talking about. So as I bring this to a close, I want you to make a specific decision. It may be just across the street. It may be God will confirm, and many people have told me this, when they stood responding to this invitation, God said, I've already sent you. You need to bloom where you are. You need to get into this book. You need to get into uh, sharing your faith right where you are. So God will speak to different people in different ways. And your pastoral team can help you if it's something really bizarre. Ooh, like joining Operation Mobilization Ship. I'm sure they'll counsel you. By the way, this church is special. Anybody who goes from this church on our ship get a thousand pound scholarship from me. You do have to raise your own money, but you got a thousand to start with. Since I have memory problems, Dave Armstrong will write that down. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's take a moment of silent prayer. What's the Lord saying to you? These are strong words, but maybe you needed strong words for your situation. Just worship Him. Acknowledge any, any sin the Holy Spirit has convicted you of. What about lukewarmness? I battle lukewarmness. I think more now in the senior years. My old lazy streak is coming back. And I just have to constantly just repent and say, Lord, fill me afresh. Fill me afresh. Acts 4.31. Just take a moment to pray. If we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to give us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you'll pray that prayer, like Isaiah, and I think of the words of the Lord Jesus, as the Father sent me, so send I you. I think of the words in Romans. How will they go unless they are sent? The word send is a key word in God's kingdom. And if you'll pray that prayer, here am I, send me. I'm not going to call you for, but I'm going to ask you to stand up where you are. And I, and I hope some of the thousands of people praying for me, We'll be praying for you right now. If anyone will make that decision and pray, here am I, send me, please stand right now. God bless you. It's a prayer of availability. You're not signing up to Operation Mobilization. This is just a prayer. Lord, I'm available. Some of you have already prayed that. Quite a few of you just reaffirm that in your heart. But there are others. This needs to be a moment of decision needs to be a moment of, de of destiny. Your emotions may be going in different directions, but you're taking a stand. Here am I. Send me. God bless you. God bless you. I wish I could talk with each one of you for an hour. I'd certainly be happy to answer your email. If you want to make a pilgrimage way out to my house, we can do more. Anyone else? I know there are others wrestling with this. God bless you. God bless you. Father, you see those who are standing praying this prayer. You love them. You want to use them. You want to send them. We know it may be across the street. We know it might be into the world of business or agriculture or computers <clears throat> or even government. Lord, we know we're not just called to evangelize the world. We are called to build your kingdom everywhere. Even with the realization that narrow is the way and few there will be that find it. So Lord, those who are standing right now, fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit. May others make that decision before the sun goes down today. And we believe the nations, the nations will feel the impact of steps of faith that are being taken here at this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. I'd like to pray for the whole church and ask God's blessing upon you. Lord, I thank you for this fellowship. I thank you especially for any who have come to know you in the last few years, which is certainly not happening here in the UK as much as we would dream and, and pray and plan. And so I thank you and pray this will not be too much for them. 
but they'll take what they can and they'll leave the rest for another day. You're not here to put us into some kind of guilt trip. You're here to set us free. You're here to fill us afresh. And Lord, you love us. You want to use us. And you are sending us. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.